Welcome everyone to our regular morning, weekday morning podcast on Kabbalah for Heretics with me, your heretic in chief, Yaakov Leib HaKohen. Good to see all of you in the listening audience. Let's get back to where we left off yesterday morning in volume four of the Zohar. And just to back up to let you know, I say it every morning, we have been studying the Zohar volume by volume, cover to cover, every weekday morning, with only a few exceptions, over the past 30 years. Think of it. Think of it. I'm not talking about every now and then. I'm not talking about whenever it occurred to us. Every weekday morning, volume by volume, cover to cover, page by page, and sentence by sentence. That's taken us through volumes one, two, and three, and uh, we are now finishing volume four. So just to let you know, this is a project that you're listening to. It's a project we undertook almost 30 years ago. And one that we have been doing, as I said, every weekday morning. There have been some exceptions. For example, I was in the hospital for two and a half months just recently, and we could not uh, broadcast the podcast during that time. Of course, as soon as I got back out and got back home and got back recovered, we resumed. So it's good to see all of you in the listening audience. Rabbi Eliezer was once traveling along a road on which Rabbi Phineas ben Yar happened to be coming towards him. The ass on which Rabbi Phineas was riding whinnied, and he said, Verily, from the note of gladness in the ass's voice, I see that I shall meet someone here. Let's just stop for a second. The a very interesting animal. Its use in the Zohar symbolically is uh, is astonishing, as well as in the written Torah. If you remember, Balaam's ass spoke to him. It's the only time in the written Torah that an animal speaks. And there are other times when the animal of the ass is featured. For example, Jesus comes into Jerusalem on an ass. Here again, we see this ass, and we see, although it doesn't speak necessarily, it whinnies. And the rabbi says, Verily, from the note of gladness in the ass's voice, I see that I shall meet someone here. Why am I why am I pausing at this point? Because it tells us something that's easily sloughed over. This ass, this animal is prescient. It knows what animals are prescient. Animals have a soul. Animals have a soul. Oh, that's a bunch of bullshit. Animals don't have a soul. Don't tell me animals have a soul. Well, elsewhere we are told they do. For example, Balaam's ass that speaks. There is a midrash. Um, an illustrative story from the, I believe, Talmud that says, because the dogs of Egypt did not, they were awarded the unkosher hind portions of cattle. Therefore, whenever anyone who has eaten those unkosher portions of the cattle come to the gates of heaven, 
the dogs say to him, You may not enter because you ate our portion. What is that saying? It's saying that dogs go to heaven, first of all. There they are. And that they judge us at the gates of heaven. Like St. Peter. They say, who may and may not enter? You may not enter because you ate our portion. The details of that are, are far less important than the fact that it gets said than the fact that these dogs, these animals, are in heaven, guarding the gates of heaven against those who have eaten unkosher meat. I was told this uh, at uh, Sabbath dinner once by a, a famous rabbi in Los Angeles who had, who had invited me along with many others to attend uh, his uh, Sabbath uh, dinner. And uh, I raised my hand to ask a question, and he said, what, what do you want to ask? I said, Rabbi, what does this mean? And he got very angry at me and says, it means we must not eat unkosher meat. Just shows you the depth of understanding, even in a great rabbi who was allegedly a mystic. <laughs> allegedly, that was the reason that uh, I was invited because he heard of me as a fellow mystic. Totally does not see the inner, deeper meaning. Animals have soul. Now, I know that doesn't come to come as any big news to many of you. You know perfectly well animals have soul. <clears throat> if you've lived with animals, you know they have a soul. But even those who have lived with animals and who will say, oh, yes, animals have a soul, when a teacher says that to them, when a teacher tells them that that is what is being taught in the Zohar, they become very critical. There are four levels of soul. Nefesh, Ruach, Neshuma, and the highest level of souls. That lower level of soul, Nefesh, is literally considered the animal soul. It is a soul that all of us creatures have, we are born with. It is the lowest level of soul, but it is a soul nonetheless. Man is born with nefesh. Dogs, cats, snakes, frogs are born with nefesh. The difference is that man can raise himself up from nefesh to the next highest level, neshama. The animal cannot do that. The animal is not gifted with that by God. However, the human can awaken and lift up the soul of the animal. The Baal Shem Tov says, all animals come to us in order that we may awaken the soul in them. Now, I hope you're not saying to yourself, oh, I know that. Oh, I know that. that I know that. I know that. You don't know it. And you surely don't know it insofar as it appears in the Zohar. If you want to get anything out of what is being taught in these podcasts, stop telling yourself you already know that. The chances are very great that you do not the fact that you would tell yourself you do know it is the best signal that you don't. <laughs> so we come back to this passage. Rabbi Eliezer was once traveling along the road on which Rabbi, Eliezer, Rabbi Phineas ben Yar happened to be coming toward him. He doesn't see him yet. The ass on which Rabbi Phineas was riding, whinnied, and he said to himself, Verily, 
from the note of gladness in the ass's voice, I see that I shall meet someone here. And when he emerged from under the brow of the hill, he saw Rabbi Eliezer approaching and said, Assuredly, the Amen of the ass's voice has been fulfilled. Notice what he says. Surely the Amen, the blessing of the ass's voice, has been fulfilled. Rabbi Eliezer then to him and kissed him. He said to him, If you have the same destination as I have, let us join company. And if not, go on your way. He replied, Indeed, I was going to look for you. And since I have found you, I will follow you, and we can keep company. I want to again emphasize the importance of the soul of the animal and the references to the animal and its prescience here in the Zohar. For our own neo Sabbatean Kabbalah, this is of extreme importance. As the Shem Tov says, everything that comes to man, his tools, his animals, all have sparks of holiness, a soul waiting to be raised by him back to God. This is why I have animals. I have a lot of them. Three dogs and three cats, all living indoors with me. Yes, I love animals. I, I adore animals. Yes, I enjoy them. But more than anything else, I have them because I know I must awaken and raise up that soul and that animal back to God. That is why it has come to me. I do not choose the animals I live with. They it's me. They come to me. And for that very purpose. And with Kavona, we must do it with Kavona, with intention. Oh, yes, I, oh, yeah, I, I raise the, the soul of my dog. Yes, I love him a lot. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about literally, consciously, with intention. Raising up the animal soul. I've written a piece on that that you can find on the Dunma West website. The Jakun of Raising Animals. I suggest you read it. <clears throat> Rabbi Eliezer then came up to him and kissed him. He said to him, If you have the same destination as I have, etc., etc., Rabbi Phineas then began to discourse on the verse, The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem. From the Psalms. Why, he said, asking a rhetorical question, from Zion. Now, you see, this is Kabbalah. This is how to interpret a Kabbalistic text. It, it just isn't natural, as you would, to ask, well, why out of Zion? Well, the answer would be, of course, well, because, because that's what it says, but that's not the answer. Why out of Zion? Because there are blessings, there, pardon me, because there are blessings repose as it is written quote from there the lord handed the blessings even life forevermore also from psalms So it says, Rabbi Phineas then began a discourse on the verse, The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem. 
Why from Zion? Because there blessings repose, as it is written. From there the Lord commanded the blessings, even life for everyone. Again, let's look deeper into that. If it is from Zion that life and blessings come, there must be its opposite from which death and curses come. And indeed, that is so of God. Look at the ten sephirites. Look at them. There are two sides, two columns, the right-hand column and the left-hand column. And then, of course, there is the center column. The left-hand column is the sitra achra, the side of evil, the side of judgment, the side of unholiness, of curses and death. And the right-hand side, the side of chesed, is the side of blessings and life. That is the side of Zion. God has two sides. This left-hand side, the sitra achra, and this right-hand side, the side of Zion. God's mind is in a state of duality. And it's always a toss-up which aspect of God you're going to encounter if and when you do encounter him. That's what, this, that's what the ten sephirites are illustrating. The sephirites illustrate the mind of God. And you'll notice that the mind of God is divided between the right side and the left side. This is one of the reasons that I've been emphasizing raising up the soul of animals. Because in doing that, or raising up the holy sparks in everything, food, water, anything, you are restoring God to its equilibrium if you do it out of intention. Our goal is not to live a better life. Our goal is not to lead, to tell you how to lead a happy life or a good life or a moral life. It has nothing to do with improving you, each other, or even the world. Our goal is to reconcile the mind of God. It is for that purpose that God created us. The first creation, if you'll notice in Genesis, Adam and Eve are created at the same time. That is, in a state of duality. And that doesn't work. Scripture says, and there was yet no man to till the ground. So God creates a second Adam, alone, just that Adam. And in that Adam, he breathes ruach, a soul, and makes that Adam a living creature capable of restoring God itself to unity. When God is healed, which is what I'm talking about, man shall be healed. We go about it as we do everything, half-assed backwards. We are not going to accomplish anything by healing the world if the world is totally at mercy in this ambiguity and duality in God. The suffering of the world represents the suffering of God. The world suffers this conflict between good and evil because God, in his mind, is suffering the conflict between good and evil. And until that conflict in God is done away with, until God is restored to the unity that he was in before creating the, the universe. He is suffering. And therefore, man is suffering. This is our primary teaching. That everything we do must be done for the sake of healing God first. It says in the prophet, and on that day, on the day of the coming of the Messiah, God shall be one 
again, and his name shall be one again. God is not one. His name is not one. He is in a state of extreme duality. But man can and must and will reunite the mind of God. And on the day that he does, then again God will be one and his name one. I'll end here for the morning. We'll uh, continue with this tomorrow morning. In the meantime, one or two of you are here to do the recording, so let me ask you if you have any comments or questions. Raise your hand if you do. Excellent. Yeshai, go ahead. David, as David said, he won't be able to, but go ahead, Yeshai. <clears throat> Waiting for Yeshai. There we go. Yeshai says, powerful broadcast. All we do is to heal God. First animals have a soul. They go to heaven. And even tools hide in them. God's struggling to return to itself. First and foremost, we heal God. Otherwise, everything we do for ourselves will sputter. And it will not take. Excellent. Absolutely, Yeshai. Absolutely. God bless you. All right, now let us, uh, as I do every morning, conclude our podcast by my recitation of the Kaddish, the traditional prayer for the dead, in honor of our departed beloved brother and fellow Kohen, Leonard Cohen. Yiskadal v'yiskadal shmei rabo, v'omo divro chirusei v'yam l'chmal chusei, v'chachon v'yom echon v'chayi d'chol b'yis Yisrael, v'agolo uv'yizman kol r'v'yimnu amen. shalom <laughs> Olenu vi'al kol Yisrael v'imru amen. That concludes our podcast for this morning. God willing, we'll be here tomorrow morning. In the meantime, yivirecha ad